If you've subscribed to my Far From Expert podcast, I'm about to take its shameless advantage of your interest. With this podcast, I'm hoping to spark more dialogue about the AP Art History course. And yes, I'm also hoping to promote some changes that I truly believe would strengthen the course for both students and teachers. I'd planned to record this message last year, but I decided I should teach the curriculum one more year before I spout it off on YouTube. So let me start by saying that for the most part, I like the new curriculum. I appreciate having a set list of required works. The more global orientation panicked me a little at first, but it turned out to excite my students and it certainly broadened my own understanding. I admit, I find the essay questions unnecessarily wordy, but overall they're more precise, easier to teach, and therefore they're more likely both to promote and to reflect genuine learning. But, This course is a bear to teach. I've talked with a number of AP Art History teachers over the past two years at summer institutes and other teacher gatherings. And I'm not alone in ending the year feeling as if I've run a marathon and the energy drink did time out before I crossed the finish line. I think the basic problem is that the course's broader global scope requires us to teach and students to master a truly huge volume of unfamiliar historical and cultural context. Since neither class time nor student energy and commitment is infinite, some of this context comes at the expense of other valuable ways to learn about art. More importantly, I think the pace exhausts students and therefore potentially dampens some of their enthusiasm for the subject. So I'd like to offer a few suggestions that I believe would preserve the strengths of the new curriculum, especially its global focus and the set list of works, but would also make the task less daunting for teachers and students. I'd start at the beginning and end of the College Board's curriculum. I promise I am not here to defend the legacy course, but it does strike me that the earlier choice to leave prehistoric works out of the curriculum made some sense. I always taught some prehistoric works anyway, but the new curriculum with its much broader range of global prehistoric works demands a huge amount of teacher prep. Khan Academy has written to the rescue, but available background material on most of the required prehistoric prehistoric works is pretty thin. To complicate matters, many of the works have provoked competing theories from the experts. Now, I actually find these controversies rather fun to teach, but it means that I'm presenting complicated and confusing theories to students at the very beginning of the course when they're just getting started, and of course, when some of them at least are still free to decide to drop the course. It also requires teachers to try to guess which competing theory is likely to show up on the test, and I've seen problems with this in some of the sample questions from the college board. Finally, the chosen works have students skipping all over the globe. Now, I know that's part of the point, but it does raise student anxiety early in the course. Basically, global prehistoric art is both a logical place to start the course and a tough place to start the course. I believe that the new curriculum demands that we linger there longer than we should given all that lies ahead. On to the end of the course. Now, I love the global contemporary unit. But it still puzzles and concerns me that 10% of 2,250 image sets comprise works produced after 1980. My students, at least, do not need persuading that what is happening right now is much, much more important than almost anything that ever happened in history. And I'm not sure we should be reinforcing that prejudice. More to the point, the sheer number of global contemporary works combined with the time constraints that we're all facing at the end of the course, means that my students and I sprint just when it would really be fun to slow down and spend more time discussing some fascinating and provocative art. Basically, my concern is sheer quantity. So here is a simple proposal that I think would preserve the course's global focus at the beginning and end, but maybe make the whole enterprise a little less quelling. The College Board could require and we could teach half of the global prehistoric and global contemporary works each year, switching to the other half the following year. Teachers new to the course would then have two years to come up to speed on these works, which are among the most difficult to prep in the course. The time and money the college sport spent acquiring rights to these works and accumulating background information would not go to waste which I gather is one of the arguments the College Board makes against uh, adopting changes. Uh, Sounds like they skipped my lecture on sunk costs, but that's a different course. At any rate, test writers would still be able to draw on the full curriculum. They would just do it in alternating years. 
I'd also like to see the College Board change out, I'll say three, of the global contemporary works every year, just to reinforce the message that art is a living enterprise. Learning about these works, I think, would be fun. So calling the image set a list of 250 fudges the total demand on teachers and students, since many of the required image sets are, in fact, entire sites. Now, I don't have any quarrel, for example, with teaching the Acropolis as an image set, especially since the College Board helpfully lists the buildings that we have to cover in more detail and actually, therefore, leaves a few things out. I am forgiving them for eliminating the caryatid porch. I teach it anyway. But the Agora in art history and what in the Agora. We don't get any guidance. I'm all for explaining that Athens had a commercial political center and a separate religious center, but that still doesn't tell me how to teach the Agora as art. I think that's the most egregious example, but I also question whether we really have time to cover both Machu Picchu and Cusco as entire sites. And by the way, I think they are both very worthwhile objects of study. I was fortunate enough to visit both in the last few years. But again, we have to make some hard choices given time constraints. I kind of wonder about Great Zimbabwe and Nan made all, uh, not because they aren't historically important, I actually teach about them in AP World History, uh, but I question how much they really demonstrate. Uh, they show that sometimes African and Pacific cultures built in stone, but actually it was the exception. Uh, I think my students would learn more about African and Pacific art from studying, oh, just give a couple of possible examples, the Kabaka's Reed Palace in Uganda, or a Maori meeting place in New Zealand. But the real challenge comes from trying to teach an entire site. Basically, I think it would be worth looking at these full site image sets and seeing a few could be eliminated, better elucidated, or maybe just reduced in scope. Okay, I almost hate to dive into the topic of African and Pacific art because I do not want people to think that I am dismissing the importance of these works as art or uh, urging a return to the legacy course that often neglected them. Not at all. For what it's worth, I lived in Uganda as a teenage exchange student. I specialized in African politics in graduate school, and I have long taught about Nigeria and AP comparative government. I also really do want to honor the artistic heritages of all my students, though I admit uh, I do hold to the uh, politically incorrect view, or perhaps politically incorrect view, that global art is everybody's human heritage. But... Because the required images span so many cultures within these geographical categories, I find that these units too easily turn into a brute memorization of titles and tribes. We just don't get to linger anywhere. And therefore, I think it has the perverse effect of making understanding of the cultures of this rich, these rich regions uh, less demanding and interesting than that of Europe and Asia. So what do you see on this PowerPoint slide? All of these beautiful and I would argue culturally significant works are products of the Ashanti in what today is Ghana. My, I would enjoy getting to spend an, an entire day exploring this group's rich history, its artistic output, including women's textile art, which is notably missing from the African image set. Yes, we would have to skip other works, other tribes, other great art. But what's going to be true no matter what we do, we are only going to cover a tiny, tiny element of African and Pacific art just because they are so culturally diverse. Maybe as a transition, the College Board could choose one culture from each region and include, say, three to four works from that culture in the image set and try out this approach. By the way, that's more the way it's handled in the Art of the Americas unit, which I think is easier to teach as a result. And then, of course, cutting that number from the rest of the list and see how it goes. So art history teachers love to shake our heads at some of the College Board's choices. But I do think some have proved obscure and difficult to research. So here are the two that I thought were the most problematic. Others probably would add, a, add different works to the list. With the catacomb of Priscilla, so many catacombs are better documented or actually show up in the art history texts that we're encouraged to purchase. Is it possible the College Board chose this image because of the controversy it generated about whether it showed a woman priest? If so, somebody should fess up and tell us. It is, in fact, a highly disputed theory. I tell my students about it anyway, be, just in case it came up, uh, but I'd like to know if that's the point of that choice and whether that really is the best choice 
choice there. As for the scenes from Revelation, my first year I could find nothing on this work, and I looked pretty hard. Uh, eventually, Khan Academy rose to the rescue, but it's a very complicated, difficult, and somewhat obscure work. I, I just wonder if there might be a better choice. In general, I think looking a little bit more at trying to find choices that show up in art history textbooks would make life easier for people whose students may have more limited access to the internet or more limited resources. Okay, again, when art history teachers get together, they are likely to bitch and moan about the works that got left off the list. Me, I'm particularly shocked that the early Italian Renaissance, which is surely a turning point in art history, generates such a significantly fewer number of required images than art produced after 1980. The course leaves out the great Florence Baptistry door competition, Brunelleschi's Dome, and Masaccio, just to cite a few examples. I teach them anyway, since they're so important to the development of art. But let's face it, students do not pay as much attention to works that they know are not in the required set of images. We all have our list of what we consider to be shocking omissions. Me, again, I'd include and do include in my teaching oil paintings by the great oil masters Goya and Rembrandt, whose work is only represented in the course by prints. I want my students to know the work of Artemisia Gentileschi and other Baroque women greats. We do have Rachel Reich. Uh, surely students need to know about Guernica and about the painting revolution that Jackson Pollock wrought, or maybe the com painting commercial revolution that Jackson Pollock wrought. I personally miss Minoan art and El Greco. That may be a personal taste. So yes, I think some work should be added back in. But if the other reforms were adopted, we'd all have a little more time and breathing room to get to works that we as teachers really think should be included or that are just personal favorites that we can talk about with passion. But to butcher Janice Joplin, freedom's just another word for plenty left to lose when it comes to helping our students succeed on the exam. And I'm done. Not too long, and I think not really very radical. I don't really have good advice about how to reach the college board with these suggestions, should you happen to agree with them. But many of us will be attending AP Institutes this summer. Some of you may have a more direct line to the powers that be than I do. So here is some contact information that I took directly from the internet. Uh, if you want to contact me, I've included my email, but please understand that I am just one more AP teacher. I do not have any clout with the great and powerful, mysterious college board. To my fellow teachers, congratulations for getting through another year and best wishes for all the art history to follow. To my students, please remember what I told you time and again. We are going to talk a lot about the AP Art History test. You can forget all that now if you've finished the course. What really matters is that you came to love art, I hope, and that in the future you'll get to chase it around the world. Long after I have forgotten your scores, I will treasure the photos you send me standing in front of paintings or sculptures or buildings. And that really is all.